The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome. Order of service is the uh, prayer and preaching to be found on page 260. A number of weeks ago, uh, the circuit counselor for our uh, circuit came to worship here with his family. Um, nicely dressed family. Uh, um, uh, he sang vigorously. Um, and he had a nice experience. He talked to me uh, afterwards about it. But he, afterwards, he also said, Dave, no one greeted us. So that's a problem. <laughs> and this is not a, you know, they were nicely dressed. These were not um, uh, potentially threatening people. <laughs> so uh, that's a joint effort for all of us. Um, if you see somebody that you don't know, please introduce yourself to them and say, say good morning and welcome them. Um, opening hymn, O Christ, You Walked the Road, 424. <laughs> This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and repents. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him change and take up his cross Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
The Old Testament reading for the first Sunday in Lent is from Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will surely, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man's The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. This is the word of the Lord. We read responsibly Psalm 32 found in your service bulletin. Blessed is one whose transgressions is forgiving whose sin is covered, and whose whose Lord counts no indignity, and in whose spirit there was no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up by the heat. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the inequity of my sin. Therefore, as everyone who is free, offer her you time. So the great waters shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. The Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle is from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, 
and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Your death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one's man, one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift. By the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification, if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who received the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through one man, Jesus Christ, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Please ride for the, rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. <coughs> Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then, he, then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. We recite the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant, his maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Please turn to page 322 in the hymnal, page 322. For the second article of the Creed and its meaning. Together, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. And we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Sermon text is from Genesis chapter 3. At my former church in St. Louis, we had a school and a family in that school with three boys. The mom was growing tired of the mad dash to get the boys ready for school. They were not cooperative. They would drag their heels. Finally, mom had had enough. She told the kids, whether you are ready or not, tomorrow we are leaving this house at 7.40. Sure enough, the next morning, three boys were marched into Grace Chapel Lutheran School in their pajamas <laughs> to the great amusement of their classmates. They went straight to the principal's office and explained the situation to Mr. Miller. When he finally stopped laughing, he gave each a tardy and sent them back home to get them properly dressed. So, what do you think about public shaming and humiliation as a disciplinary tool? Our family loves going to Camp Arcadia on the shores of Lake Michigan, but if you're late coming in for a meal, sometimes they make you sing. Two foursomes of men, fresh off the golf course, singing, I'm a little teapot show. <laughs> they want the hand signals, too. Judges are sometimes creative with their sentences. In place of prison time, one man was ordered to wear a sandwich board in front of Walmart. I am a thief, it said. I stole from this store. Even dogs sometimes are given a sign to wear around their necks. They caught me drinking again from the toilet. <laughs> what do you think about public shaming as a disciplinary tool? Got me to thinking. What would happen if God punished me in such ways? How would you and I feel if we were given a, a sign to wear around our necks or a sandwich board to wear that spelled out the worst of our sins? I'm pretty sure we wouldn't much like it. I know this because we go to great lengths to hide our sins, right? Bank robbers wear ski masks. Thieves work under the cover of darkness. White-collar criminals bury their misdeeds in a set of doctored books. We delete emails or browse the internet using privacy setting. We lie about our misbehaviors. We bait people into making false conclusions. We distract and mislead them with red herrings. There's something about us that has always detested the feeling of guilt. So we go to great lengths to hide our sins. You can see that already in Genesis 3. The sin of Adam and Eve was they wanted to be like God. And the devil beguiled them into thinking all they had to do was eat the forbidden fruit and it will fix them right up. Quote, 
When you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. How could they have fallen for that? But they did. Apparently in their innocence, they were naive to the devil's cunning. They ate and their eyes were indeed open to nakedness and shame, to sin and death. In a pathetic effort to cover it all up, they sew some fig leaves together and hide. What happens next? God tries to draw a confession out of Adam and Eve. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Normally, God's presence, his omnipresence, is quite imperceptible to us. And here it seems God is deliberately trying to make his presence known to them. It's as if God is saying, I'm here, Adam. Do you have anything that you want to tell me? No, he really doesn't. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. God turns up the volume and the pressure. Adam, where are you? Now, of course, God knows precisely where Adam is, but he's giving Adam an opportunity to come out of the bushes and to come clean and confess his sin. Does Adam make good on it? No. He says, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God coaxes Adam towards a confession. Who told you that you were naked? Silence. And then here comes a softball right across Adam's strike zone. Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Swing and a miss. The woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I did eat. Can you see the glance that Eve just shot at Adam? <laughs> Clearly, the horizontal relationship between Adam and Eve lies in ruins. The vertical relationship between God and man is also in tatters. But Adam, he's not yet done. He's on a roll, heaping sin upon sin. He says, the woman you gave me, that is, if you hadn't made her, I wouldn't be in this mess. Earlier, he was so grateful for his wife. This at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. He was so happy, so grateful, so much in love. But now it's this woman you gave me. Clearly, this one has a defect. And it seems Adam wants God to take her back. So Adam took a pass on each opportunity to confess not my fault, he says. That's his story, and he's going to stick to it. Seeing Adam as a lost cause, God turns his attention to Eve, giving her opportunity. What is this you have done? The serpent deceived me, and I ate. That is, I really didn't want to eat it. Didn't even look all that good to me, you know. And I eat like a mouse to begin with. But the devil nearly forced it into my mouth, sort of like wedding cake at a reception. That's her story, and she's going to stick to it. And you know, that's our story too. We are the children of Adam and Eve many times over. We too want to be like God. We want God's power. We want his wealth. We want people to revere us as they revere God, to respect us, to love us as they love God, to fear us. We don't want to have to do that which God doesn't, want, doesn't have to do. And one of the things God never has to do is confess sin. That dirty business is for sinners, not for deities, or not for wannabe gods. So, Wanting to be like God, we will avoid confessing sin every chance we get. You and I, we come from a long line of sinners, and one attribute we share with them all is the severe aversion to owning up to our sin. Far better, we think, to sew together a few fig leaves and call it a day. Let's go back to those fig leaves for a moment. 
Maybe for a time, they gave Adam and Eve at least the perception of privacy and secrecy. But how well do you think those leaves worked over time? How long do you think they lasted? The text says they sewed them together. I picture the thread tearing right through that leafy matter with the slightest of strain. And if they're not falling apart, they're starting to dry and shrivel. They're itchy and effect ineffective. They're a constant source of aggravation and anger. They probably caused more sin than they covered up. It was an entirely futile and pathetic attempt to deal with the problem of sin. And I think the Bible wants us to think that, to know that, because man's fixes for our own sin, denial, deflection, substance abuse, becoming a workaholic, whatever, man's fixes for his own sin have always been futile and pathetic, no more effective than a few tattered fig leaves. Not long ago, there were a number of students up at Watertown High School who got into a whopping load of trouble. One had taken an inappropriate picture with a cell phone and sent it off to a special friend who in turn sent it off to others. Word got out. The police became involved because the kids were under 18. It was considered child pornography. The students thought that simply deleting the pictures from their cell phones would protect them. But that's just another fig leaf. It doesn't work. It only gives the perception of privacy and secrecy and anonymity. Police seized a number of cell phones as evidence, and when it was all said and done, the district attorney told the police they could not return those phones to the kids because there was no way of completely erasing them. Electronic remnants are always left behind, and with those remnants, the pictures could be recalled. So, the police literally took the phones outside and took a hammer to them. Like Adam and Eve, we kid ourselves if we think the fig leaves will suffice. It's delusional to think we live under the protective canopy of privacy and secrecy and anonymity Last week, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal reviewing some of the secrecy apps being sold for smartphones. Long story short, none of them can guarantee privacy or anonymity. Not even the invisibility cloak in Harry Potter was foolproof. Professor Snape couldn't see Harry Potter, but he could still hear Potter's uh, rapid breathing, his nervous breathing. And though we might be able to hide our sin from, from others for a time, there's no hiding it from God. Psalm 139, where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, they're even there. Your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for the darkness is as light with you. Neither the low-tech nor the high-tech fig leaves will ever leave God in the dark. He knows all and sees all. Isn't it remarkable then that knowing everything there is to know about us God should still love us? In our text, God punishes Adam and Eve for sure, but he does not wipe them out. Instead, he takes tender care of them. Verse 21, And the Lord God made for them garments of skin and clothed them. What a relief. What a relief it must have been to get rid themselves of those cursed fig leaves and put on something so much more comfortable and practical. Remember, whatever God makes, he makes very well. I suspect whatever they, whatever, whenever they looked at those garments, it reminded them of their sin and fall, but also of God's continued care for them. Perhaps it also taught them that God's solutions 
to sin are so much better than any we can come up with. And that points to the ultimate solution for them and us. Verse 15, God promised to send an offspring of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. This, of course, is Jesus, second Adam, he's called, who was also tempted in every way that we have been, but he never gave in. His innocence did not make him naive to the devil's coming, cunning. His innocence foiled the devil, sent him packing. And when Jesus went to the cross and died for us, he delivered a head-crushing blow to the serpent and won for us the forgiveness of sins. In holy baptism, God gave you that forgiveness. There he washed you of your sin, covered you over with his innocence. There he gave you a garment, one far more effective than any you can make for yourself. That garment was not made of leaves or of leather, but of Christ's own righteousness. It covers you over. It hides your sin. So part of the baptismal liturgy in the hymn, though, is to place a white blanket around the infant to to show this garment of righteousness. That is, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees Christ's innocence. When he looks at you, he doesn't see a sandwich board with a litany of the worst of your transgressions. He sees Christ's own blamelessness. When God forgives you, he doesn't leave behind any electronic remnants of that sin. Once it's forgiven, it's over. He will never again summon it up and hold it against you. As far as the east from the west, so far has the Lord removed your transgressions from you. In fact, he destroyed those remnants with a hammer. The hammer that nailed his son to the tree. He will not hold them against you because he has already held them held his son against them. Therefore, in Isaiah, he promises, I will remember your sins no more. All our homegrown attempts to solve the guilt of sin are as futile as the fig leaves. But the Lord has the perfect solution for us. Christ. And his cloak, his robe of righteousness that covers us over. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. The sermon hymn is one that we have not sung before. It's very simple, but Jeff will play it through once before we sing.
Very nicely done. Thank you very much for waking up so early to get here for this service. <laughs> and thanks to the parents as well. <laughs> In our prayers, we pray for those celebrating our anniversary, for Marge and Floyd Gecki celebrating their 68th anniversary. Congratulations to you. Um, yeah, I think that's worthy of <laughs> Marge wrote um, a wonderful little letter, um, and in it she, she, you wrote, Today we are the oldest we have ever been, and yet the youngest we will ever be. <laughs> Very nice. We pray also for Roger and Marion Zimmerman celebrating their 56th anniversary. <laughs> and for Steve and Judy Zilmer, I'm not sure what anniversary that is. <laughs> For Diane Thompson celebrating a major birthday, I've not been given permission, I'm not going to cross that line. <laughs> for Christian Timothy Robinson, who was baptized last night. For Pat Newberger's brother-in-law, Mark Sherry, who is very ill. For Donald Vince, who has been diagnosed recently with acute leukemia. For David Hasslinger undergoing heart surgery this next week. For Paul Winger and Bill Roser and Diana Zimdars and for Gail Groth, who are fighting cancer, for Richard Frinke and James Godmanson in hospice care, for Ken Schwantes, is scheduled for a knee replacement this next week, and also for those in prison. Please stand for prayer. Prayers are on page 265. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. 
Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon, with all our heart, with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For, ho for the holy Christian church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray for the Lord. Pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For countries in turmoil, and countries where potential hostilities might arise. For the Ukraine, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our children, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those celebrating anniversaries, for all the marriages of our church, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For an ability to freely quickly and frequently confess our sins to God and to one another, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O oh Lord God, you led your ancient people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide the people of your church that following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and never hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angels be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. In place of the New Testament canticle, we sing 937, 937.
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.